Tonight at 6 o'clock, we have a fellowship titled, Can You Quiz? Uh, There will be several that will be joining me in quizzing against our children and our teenagers. You might not have kids or teenagers, but you just want to gather and fellowship. We're providing a meal for you. And we had a registration for this event. But you might say, man, I forgot to register, and, and can I still come? The answer is yes. We're planning for, for some more th- to show up that didn't have a chance to register, so there's still time for you to come. Come on. We'd love to have you. It'll be a great evening tonight at 6 o'clock. I was talking to one of the children last night, and, and I, I told her, I'm, I'm going to beat you. And she goes, no, you're not. I'm going to beat you. And we were walking out of the house, and the kid screamed across the way as she was going to her car, Pastor, I'm going to beat you. So I drove up to the car where she was with her family, and I said, well, will you at least be a little nice and let me try to beat you? She said, no way. I'm going to beat you, and I'm not even going to be humble about it. We're going to have a great time tonight. We'd love to see you. It would be a great time to fellowship. And uh, just for, for those of you that are wondering, no, our quizzing program doesn't teach kids that. They, we were just bantering back and forth for an hour or so, and, and uh, she was just getting in the spirit. That's all. So there's, there's no lack of humility being taught to our quizzers. It was just fun between a pastor and a kid, and it was a great time together. Very meaningful. Have you ever had... A product, purchased a product, or have you ever been to a place that didn't measure up to the hype? You ever been to a place or ever bought a product that was hyped, you bought it, you went, and it didn't measure up? Anybody have a product or a place? What was that? You raised your hand. Did you have something? A fishing lure called Mighty Bites. Let me guess, it didn't catch a fish. No fish. All right. Any other product or place? Yeah. Your house. I'm not sure what, what Dad said, what? So uh, we're going to leave that for a discussion at dinner time today. Any, <laughs> any, <laughs> any other pr- a product or a place that didn't measure up? Yeah. All right, for those of you watching online, I'm not going to repeat that, but it had something to do with Disney and a waiter, uh, so we're going to leave that one alone too. Anyone, anyone else had a product or a place that didn't measure up? One more. Anyone? I bought a tool. I needed a tool for a project, and so I, I, I was newly married and didn't have the tool. I went to the dollar store, and... Some of you are laughing. You know where this is going. I, I was like, oh, man, I can buy this tool for a buck. So I, I, I grabbed it off the shelf. I proudly went and paid my dollar plus tax, took it home, used it. It broke, and I was out a dollar and uh, borrowed the tool from somebody else. But it was, a, it was a product that didn't measure up for me. In today's society, we have things like Amazon and Google and uh, Uh, TripAdvisor and Yelp, you can go to these places and you can look at whether a place has met the expectations of other individuals who have either purchased that product or have been to that place to see what their experiences have been. It's an awesome time to live because you can see all the different experiences that all of these different people have had with a place or a product before you try it yourself. Despite all of that, we, we still can have different experiences from individuals that have highly rated a place or a product, primarily because their expectations are very different than our expectations. This morning, we're continuing our sermon series on joy, and we're looking into a time and place when King David is reigning over God's people, and uh, the passage is found in Psalm chapter 4, if you want to join me there. Psalm chapter 4, and David discovers that God's people have, have come to conclude that uh, God is not meeting their expectations. So we'll find that, Psalm chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, we read these words. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. 
For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. David has encountered a people of God who are pretty unhappy. They're losing their joy. And they are expressly talking to God, hey God, we're your people here. Can't you cut us a break? We're, we're trying hard. We're, we're, we're your chosen ones. And, and it seems like you aren't looking at us with favor. You, you aren't keeping up to your end of the bargain. You know, David rated you a five on Google, and you honestly, that's not been my experience with you, God. You need to get your act together. The, the ensuing result is that David is sharing with us is that they're losing joy, and it brings me to the first teaching point of this morning, and it's this. Dwelling on what you think you deserve is a recipe for lost joy. Dwelling on what you think you deserve is a recipe for lost joy. In 1986, Janet Jackson penned the song, What Have You Done For Me Lately? And if you know it, you've already thought, ooh, yeah, right? You hummed it in your head. The song was some of you are like, yeah, I did that. In 1986, Janet Jackson decided to take her frustration out on her ex-husband and pen for the world her disappointment, what have you done for me lately, and wrote this song about her ex-husband. It's, it became a mantra for all the people who have experienced disappointments in a relationship that didn't measure up. Well, it's one thing to talk about your ex-husband and the expectations that they have not fulfilled. It's another thing to talk like that about God who doesn't meet our expectations. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. We like that part. But the the author of Hebrews goes on to say that this Jesus endured great hardship, difficulty, adversity, persecution. This Jesus' life is hard, very hard. The reality is that our culture has led us to embrace an ideology about relationship with God that would cause us to conclude that the reason to enter into relationship with Christ is because the Jesus life is easier than life without Jesus. Reigns a little less on the Christ followers. Christ followers have a lower rate of cancer. And if you get cancer, we serve a Jesus that is guaranteed to heal you if you have enough faith. The Jesus life is the life that has a little bit less marriage problems Kids that, that tend to rebel less than others. This Jesus life, you just go along with Jesus and everything is going to be sunshine and roses. And then we enter into the Jesus life and are like, well, wait a minute. What's going on? We, we enter into prayer and say, God, you're not measuring up to your end of the bargain. I was told that if I entered into this relationship with Jesus, life would be easy, life would be sunny, it wouldn't rain, and the grass would grow anyway. I was told that everything in life was going to be awesome if I just followed you. And then when things like deny yourself, or take up your cross and follow me, or come in last place instead of first place, or... Or, or all these other challenging words like persecution, hardship, difficulty come to our life. And we look at Jesus and we see he had those same things in his life and told us that we would experience them too. We, we begin to wonder if we got some alternate version of Christianity in the story that was presented to us. So we complain to God about it. The reality is my friends, that the only thing we deserve is eternity in hell. That's it. That's all we deserve. It's okay that none of you said amen. I didn't expect an amen to that. (laughs) That that is what we deserve. That's it. We wronged God. God. We violated relationship with him. We 
we knew what it was that he wanted us to do, and we pointed our finger at him, and we said no. He told us that, that there were things in life that would hurt us, and we said, I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. We, we so alienated ourselves from God that we didn't even know that we were alienated from God and had no idea how to find him. That's how far removed we placed ourselves from him. And yet God, by his grace, called our name. And we're here this morning singing songs about Jesus, reading scripture together, rejoicing about this God that called our name and set us free from the law of sin and death, said, you don't have to be an individual that's bound for hell. I can rescue you and give you eternal life. Everything else is a bonus. I have concluded that I will live my life in such a way that if God never blessed me with anything other than salvation, I would find contentment in relationship with Jesus. I don't care what he does or doesn't do because he's already done more than I deserve. I deserve hell and I'm not going there. Praise the Lord. I, I don't deserve anything more than what, than what he's already given to me through the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. I've, I have it made in this life. Because everything that I face in this life is temporary. I'm going to be with Jesus someday. All of this garbage is going to be gone. No matter what happens to this body, no matter what happens to the mind, no matter what happens to my finances, I get to be with Jesus someday. Could it be that, that we have lost touch with the fact of how enormously blessed we are even beyond salvation? I mean, I am, I am a blessed man. I, I have an, a, a beautiful wife, a beautiful family. I, I serve in a beautiful state, in a beautiful city. I serve at a beautiful people called GFN Church. People call me pastor, and when they do, I'm overcome with the reality that God has invited me into a special place where I get to direct people into relationship with Jesus. There's, there's a, uh, an individual that calls me pastor, a deeply southern woman, and she calls me pastor. And every time she does, it melts my heart because she calls me pastor. And the way she says it just, oh, I just wish I could record her. And anytime I'm discouraged, I would just play her saying my name. And it's, it's a privilege. I, I, am, I am blessed beyond measure. And if God never did anything, we're blessed. Brennan Manning says that he believes the problem with all of this is that we, we like to worship an experience of God instead of God. And when we worship an experience of God, what we need to continue in our worship of God is a new experience. And as long as we keep getting new experiences, then we'll keep worshiping God and be happy about it. But once the new experiences end, we get frustrated in our worship of God. My friends... This creator of the universe who gave Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins deserves your worship, adoration, and praise if your life is the most miserable life on this planet. We don't deserve anything more than we've already been given in Christ. And dwelling on what you deserve is a recipe for lost joy. The second thing that uh, David talks to his people about is he says, you put more joy in my heart than, those, uh, than they have when their grain and wine abound. Inner joy is more important than, than, than what it is that we do to take care of our bodies. Inner joy is more important than feeding our face. Thanksgiving is three weeks, so less than three weeks away. Hallelujah. I love Thanksgiving. We're going to my mother-in-law's and father-in-law's house for Thanksgiving, and, and they're making a turkey, and Miriam is doing the dressing and the candied yams and, and uh, a pie. Tori is making some chocolate. 
Leo and I will probably help with something, although we'll largely stay out of the way. Um, my mother-in-law will be doing things, and, and there's all this preparation. I've, I've been on something of a health kick lately, and so normally at Thanksgiving, I've put half of my plate with turkey and half of my plate with dressing, and I do everything in my power to make all of it float with gravy. That's not good for the heart, <laughs> right? So <laughs> you got to run a long time to get that stuff out of your system. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do this year, but we put all of this time and all of this energy and all of this effort and thought into, into what is it that we're going to do for Thanksgiving. And we gather and we gorge and we sit and watch football and, and then we do it again and we give ourselves a reason. Well, there's so much food, I've got to eat it again even though we're not hungry. And, 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 we, and we, just, we just keep eating and and then we throw it in the freezer and have it again later. All this time and energy into what we're going to eat. And, and yet, what about feeding our, our soul? We, we give so much time and energy and interest into where we're going to eat and what we're going to eat and, and what's on the menu and, and how it is that food is presented. But... Do, do we give attention to how it is that we're feeding the soul and its contribution to joy? I, I'm amazed at, at how, how little we will invest in our spiritual life and then wonder why we're not filled with joy. Sunday is not enough for, for joy to be your present condition. We need we need a Monday through Saturday approach to life where every moment, every opportunity is an opportunity to invest in, in this relationship with Jesus. I hate getting up at 5.30 in the morning and running, but I do it almost every day. And, and when I'm done, I, I am overwhelmed by the, the opportunity that I have to spend with Jesus in the dark with no one else around, and, and invest in my relationship with him. When, when I eat better, I'm amazed at how, how what is on my plate becomes an offering to God. So that when I pray, it's... I, I, don't, don't, don't think too highly of what I'm describing here, because... I, I still eat fudge and do things that I'm not eat things that I'm not necessarily supposed to, but I, I'm trying to take better care of my body as an offering to God. I I I I drive, hoping and praying that God will shape my heart so that I don't think poorly of some of the people around me. I I. I I live in relationship with people hoping and praying that God will shape my heart and my life so that those relationships are an expression of a heart of love for him. Everything, every moment as an opportunity to present it to God as an offering. So whenever I'm engaged in devotions, it's an opportunity for God not to tell me what you need or, or what planks you need removed from your eye, but an opportunity for God to say to me what it is that needs to be done in my life. Far too often, in fact, my prayer often has become, God, when I'm speaking to GFN Church, would you, would you first identify the plank in my own heart and life? Would, would you speak to me about my heart and life so that, so that I can become the Christ follower you want me to become? And if no one else gets it, Father, would you help me? to reflect Jesus. This isn't about you getting your act together. This is about your pastor getting his act together. This is about us collectively asking Jesus to fill our heart with a love for him that, that becomes first and foremost in life. And it, and it affects our inner joy. It affects how we live. It affects, it affects everything. Brother Lawrence, I think I've shared with you some time ago, who, who wash dishes and as, as an offering to God. There's no menial task. There's no menial event. There's no menial moment. Every moment consecrated to Jesus. And it affects our joy. As we feed the soul and find joy there. 
That third verse that Paul, or excuse me, David speaks about, he says, the peace I have will both lie, uh, in peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Peace and joy are best friends. Peace and joy are best friends. In the third century, an individual who was approaching death penned these words, quote, it is a bad world, an incredibly bad world, but I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy in which is a th- they have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure in life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They have overcome the world. They are Christian, and I want to be one. I read this week that Antifa thinks that anyone who has a belief system like Michael Pence is a homophobe, xenophobe, and needs to be gotten rid of. Well, I'm not a homophobe, I'm not a xenophobe, but I don't think I probably would be able to convince them that I'm neither. My, the solution is not to become uptight. It's not to become upset. It's not to wage war against the masses. It's to love in Jesus' name. It's it's to allow the peace of Jesus to pour from my heart and life. It's it's it's, It's to allow the heart of Christ to shape my heart. If If Antifa won the day and we became a socialist entity, I'm I'm pretty sure Jesus still wins. Peace and joy are friends. If all hell breaks loose in America today, peace and joy are our friend. Because Jesus is going to win the day. He, he already has, and he says there's a time coming when all of this stuff will resolve itself. The reason this third century man decided to embrace Christianity wasn't because of right thinking or right theology. It was because of this, this, this powerful peace and joy that was at work in the hearts and lives of the persecuted people. Persecution is not the end of the world. Freaking out that, that somehow Jesus isn't going to win the day is the end of the world. My friends, we can live with peace and joy as every moment of our day is consecrated to the Lord, every opportunity surrendered to Him, every morsel, every word, every expense of energy, it all is consecrated to Him. And in that place, regardless of what happens in my life, regardless of what the doctor tells me, regardless of what the scans may show, regardless of what happens around me, I know that in Christ, I am whole there. In Christ, I'm whole. And I find peace in my relationship with Jesus. For those of you back in our media booth, can you pull up that prayer of, of uh, St. Patrick. I'm, I'm hoping that's not a difficult thing to do quickly. Can you give me a thumbs up if that's easily possible? Oh, I got a thumbs up, so they're, they're bringing it up. I'd like to close with this prayer. Will you join me in praying this prayer? I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of the sea, stability of the earth, firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me. God's shield to protect me, 
God's hosts to save me, afar and anear, alone or in a multitude. Christ, shield me today against wounding. Christ within me, Christ before me, Christ behind me. Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ on my right, Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me. Christ in the ear that hears me. I arise today through the mighty strength of the Lord of creation. Father, joy can be a difficult thing to live every day. And when joy begins to whittle away in our heart, peace is powerfully affected. I pray today, Father, in the name of Jesus, that joy would be our present reality. That every moment of every day, whether we're washing dishes after lunch today, whether we're driving in our car, whether we're speaking to friends, family, co-workers, servers, whether we're at work this week, no matter what it is, whatever it is that we're doing, every moment consecrated to you, Father, forgive us for our spiritual neglect. Forgive us for, for the times when, when we, have, we have complained to you about what we think we deserve from you. Forgive us for the times when we've complained about what, what we think you should be doing and you, you don't appear to be doing. Father, forgive us for thinking we deserve anything more. Thank you, Father, today for doing more than we deserve through Jesus Christ. Thank you for his death and resurrection, whereby we have been transformed from death to life. Thank you for everlasting life that is found in Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to, to, opportunity to live our life surrendered to this King of kings and the Lord of lords who calls us not to this, this great life of blessing, although we frequently receive that, Thank you, Father, for calling us to the life of the cross. Thank you for calling us to last place. Thank you for calling us to follow Jesus and to enter into this world as his representatives to live the Jesus life. Thank you, Father, for the assurance of faith to know that even when the mountains fall into the sea, even when it would appear that the evil forces of hell itself are advancing, we have joy and we have peace because we know that anything that happens, we have faith in the one who will restore all things one day. We trust you. So thank you, Father, for the beauty of your word. Thank you for David's word to your people. May we live in the reality of this joy. Make it so, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.